My guest on Dan's podcast today is Roger Rosenblatt, the uh, uh, wonderful author, lecturer, presidential candidate, <laughs> and a poor repairman uh, who uh, has been active for many years as a professor at Southampton College. And I understand you're retiring or they're, they're going to run you out of town or something. It's some combination, but I, I retired. I retired as of uh, Sunday. Uh, Sunday was my last day, the day before wow. yesterday, right? And what have you done since your retirement began? Well, I've seriously taken a lot of drugs and, and embarked on a career of crime. Well, that's, that's excellent. I'm glad to hear all that. You, you, um, you certainly look that way. <laughs> no, <laughs> I, I try to hide it, but, and you certainly aren't very kind. You know, you could say you don't look that way. The, uh, the odd thing is, Dan, my old friend, um, I, I felt so liberated uh, when the actual retirement was, was a fact. But I never, you know, I never looked uh, upon teaching as a chore. I always loved it. Um, maybe it's just the idea that suddenly I actually am free to do whatever I want. As has it, uh, it hasn't quite dawned on you yet? Um, no, but what has dawned has been very pleasant. Uh, the, the notion of um, just writing and not thinking about the classes. I love the classes, but I started, you know, last year, I've been thinking about this for a year. Last year, I started to drag in thoughts of teaching, you know, and anticipation of teaching and the things that I would say to the class and realize I'm going to be saying the same things that I've said before. And I'm becoming one of those professors that you and I had whom we would gladly have murdered if we could have gotten away with it. <laughs> and so uh, I... Um, I started to think, well, maybe this is the time now. This is what other people realize, that you've done it for a long time. God knows I did it for a long time. And time well, to stop. Tell, tell, tell us where you were teaching at Southampton College and um, what courses you were taught. And I of, the beauty of the, beauty of the uh, MFA program, which you know, I started, but um, it certainly went uh, on its own quite beautifully. Uh, the beauty of it is that teachers invent their own courses, and um, I've never heard of anybody being rejected or turned down. That has something to do with the quality of the teachers. But I taught a variety of courses. I taught a course called Writing Everything, in which I have them write a poem, an essay, a personal essay, a short story, and a, a one-act play. And the one-act play is just a hoop, to have, because I have them put it on, and they, they also star in and direct their own plays. Then I had a, uh, another uh, course called um, the, uh, the Story You Are. And that was based on uh, a, a small theory of mine that writers really write just one story and that that story may find a variety of forms and a variety of approaches, but it's always basically the same story. James Joyce, when he wrote Portrait of the Artist as a young man, was no different from the James Joyce who wrote Finnegan. It's harder to find him in Finnegan because he does his best to disguise himself, but it's the same character. And so I wanted to, I wanted the students to see if they could determine who they are, you know. And we I gave them a number of writing assignments, so usually memoirish writing assignments. So we got to the the, the answer to that question: uh, the uh, the story you are. What is your story, and who are you? So that's the kind of thing I teach. What, how many people, how many young people or, or middle-aged people or old people take um, uh, that course? That you well, really uh, it's funny. It, you, you actually asked the question that almost gives the history of the course. There was a time when there were lots of middle-aged people and some older people, uh, still older people, who just came in because they wanted to write. And the standards of the course weren't as always as high as they could have been. But as the years uh, went on, the water started to rise uh, and we got better and better students and younger and younger students. So now it's very unusual to have a student uh, who is... How many students during the program? About 100, 125. Uh, and, uh, in, and an ideal class is about 12. Is, um, is, is it one of the larger programs at the, at the college or is there... I have no idea. I doubt it. I mean, I, since the university 
uh, certainly at the college at Southampton College, yes, I mean, it runs the roost. But in the university, as you know, Stony Brook is a science school, so I'm sure they have lots more concentrators in physics and chemistry. How many different, uh, uh, how many students are at the college at this point in time? At, at, at the whole university? No, at Southampton. Uh, at, at, again, 100, 125. That's, that's, we are, we are at uh, Southampton College. There is yeah. another, this wonderful marine biology uh, department uh, down the road. I don't know how many they have. I see. So it uh, this ran during this runs during the school year or in the, in the new Correct. and then the, and the are summer you, writers conference it has two, it has two venues. Uh, the, are you going to be attending the uh, conferences? No, um, once right. out out. I don't want to hang around like a ghost. Um, and uh, they've got plenty of people to do the job uh, better than I did. What um, what became you? I know you, one of your best books was Option to Become a Movie, and they were went into production just at the beginning of the pandemic. I right. can tell you how what a what a travesty that became. It really, it, <laughs> it first of all, it, it started out with all the promise in the world. Um, a small company bought it, but a good company. Um, and the uh, do you remember that movie? Well, somebody Clayton, I forget what it is. That. Uh, about a lawyer. Um, anyway, they made that movie and another one with Julia Roberts. And so they had a nice little track record. Um, and they had a young director. And I think he was just simply too young for this because we got Frank Langella for the main role, um, Bobby Cannavale for a uh, secondary role, and um, uh, uh, Stockard Channing uh, for the main uh, for the main female uh, role and, and a couple of others. They were just great, but the director couldn't do it. The thing fell apart. The producers were nuts. And they decided, <laughs> one of the things that they decided, you, you particularly will like this, be, being the Hamptons, since Rat Ratina is the Hamptons, they decided that a good location for this movie, Dan, would be Minnesota. Oh, so, cool. the, <laughs> so they shot it in Minnesota. And uh, Jenny, my wife, <laughs> just looked at one of the rushes and said, you know, there's snow on the trees. <laughs> and there, and there was anyway. It was it was a disaster. Uh, the making of it, and, and and they got through most of the shooting, but I I don't think they ever let it uh, uh, let it out. It would be, it would be a crime, I think. And uh, what book was that based on? That was on Lapham Rising, which is could could, could, could have been could have could have been a really good movie, but too bad for me. Lap Lapham Rising was set in the Hamptons. I read it. I loved it. It uh, involved a uh, an extremely rich man coming to uh, an area where a very eccentric uh, local lived, and uh, the war between them that ensued. Which uh, that is the best encapsulated description of it possible. The uh, uh, it was easy for me to, uh, I mean, it, it was easy pickings in a way, sitting ducks, because uh, I wanted to write the basic real estate, uh, a, a satire on real estate, on the, uh, the Hamptons real estate. And so I gave the guy who was the target of my hero a 60,000 foot home, thinking that's as large as it could possibly get. Then I read about this other house in East Hampton that was 100,000 feet. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, never mind. As crazy as you get, there's always reality that will be crazier. That's even even better. Sure. And then you also wrote the, what happened out here at that during this time was the collapse of the Southampton College, which was owned at that point by Long Island University. Right. And uh, Stony Brook took it over and has transformed it. And um, it's, and they're doing a, a wonderful job at the uh, the, uh, the writers program, the M M M MFA program, had been started during the era of uh, LIU. Correct. Um, I started it with a guy named Robert Patterson. I was hired actually to for LIU to begin a writing program. The guy was already there, a brilliant fellow, Robert Patterson, was there, and he and I started to see what you know. It was how do you build a program. Neither of us really knew. You have to get in because it's a state university. You have to get the approval of Albany. 
in order to get to give out a degree, the MFA degree. Anyway, we crawled along and then we made this program. And that program is now the program that exists at Stony Brook. So when, you, when they took it over, they, they kept it, which everyone loves. They, that's what they wanted. That's what they, uh, there was a wonderful president of, uh, uh, of Stony Brook then. I wish she had stayed on forever, uh, Shirley Kenny. And oh, sure, yeah. you, you knew her. Yeah, I mean, she was just great. And um, she and she knew the humanities and she understood what we were doing in our uh, program and she wanted us and she gave us whatever we needed to start to build the program. She was fabulous. Yeah, she was. And um, before that, you were an essayist. You, um, you, you were um, celebrated for some of the essays that you wrote, which uh, I, I've, I've read. I've always admired your, your work. Are you, are you planning in your retirement to uh, in, in, embark on another book? Yeah, um, I, have, I do have a book coming out in November. And um, the, and I mean, it's what I do, you know, you, uh, if you put a log before a beaver and it'll build a dam. <laughs> it, doesn't, it doesn't matter if anybody wants the dam, it doesn't matter if the dam is useful. The dam actually could be destructive, you know, with floods in the, in the villages and people screaming in their houses. Nonetheless, um, I think of myself as a beaver, put the log in front of me, I will write a book. How many books have you, have you had published? 21. And this new one, uh, can you tell us anything about it? Yes, it's really nuts. And it'll appeal, appeal especially to you. The, the, uh, it has no, um, uh, none of the uh, normalities of uh, a book. It's part essay, part elegy, um, part, uh, a, a part narrative. It's called, uh, and you'll like it too because you're a musician, it's called Cataract Blues. And... Uh, I had the counter, I had a cataract operation recently and it just revealed everything. It was just wonderful success. Um, and particularly the color blue and that started to stay with me. So I played with the idea of blue and the blues. And, uh, I was trying to remember that our daughter, Amy, who died 15 years ago and to hold uh, and to, to deal also with the whole idea of mystery, the things we cannot see that, that run our lives. So it's about memory, mystery, and the color blue, and it's called Cataract Blues. A lot of music in it. Uh, what else have you got planned? Are you moving away? Are you still going to no, be? Well, I'm in the city now. I'm back in the city. Um, we, Jenny and I have not lived in the city for 25 years. But once I knew I was going to retire, it made sense to come back. So we sold our house a year ago and now live in, uh, on the uh, Upper East Side. Uh, with a view of the river, which is very nice. Um, what else can you tell me about uh, what's going on in your life? Um, I'm doing something that I'm not really comfortable with, so uh, I want to start to move uh, in a uh, in a more in a more forward direction. Because when I say even saying the word retirement sounds like a settlement. And so I start to think about the things. And then you ask me, what did you do? And I go, all right, because Dan asked me, I'll tell him. But I don't want to, um, I don't want to think of uh, my life as a, uh, an accretion of um, things I have done. Uh, I'd much rather just keep moving. I've got six grandchildren who are fun. And, uh, the, <laughs> uh, a cataract blues is, is uh, dedicated to the grandchildren whom I call members of the band. And I give each an instrument. A consonant with his or her personality. Uh, the uh, so I've got them, and I, I, I want to, you know, um, uh, I'm, uh, to keep alive and to keep uh, and to keep moving and to keep watching and keep seeing things. You know, so you've just, led a life yourself. You every time you write for Dan's paper, you are seeing something new, and that to me that's a wonderful thing. It's absolutely a wonderful thing. Well, I thank you for that. I, I've uh, long admired your writing. Uh, I, I have, there's about four or five others who I think are wonderful writers, and you're one of them. The, not only the others, but also this one, which I'm looking at right now. Thank are you me. going to be going south during the winter? I uh, hope not. Um, the, uh, <laughs> I've gone south so often, it seems really.
really redundant. No, we will stay in the city. Um, and we got to be careful, too, because there's going to be less money as a result of retiring. And mm -hmm. the kind of books I uh, uh, make, uh, I write often make you know, royalties in double figures. So I have to <laughs> I have to be careful. But, um, you know, better to do what you want to do and, uh, and hold your breath. Are you going to do any more? Um, uh, what was that called? Where I saw you at uh, at uh, Bay Street uh, when you did. Yeah, I mean, I, that's the, the only sore point between us. You said, I, you know, I was a pretty good piano player. I'm a fucking great piano player. And <laughs> <laughs> and actually, I wasn't that. But I'm getting I'm getting I'm getting better. Uh, Ginny gave me for my last birthday. Uh, jazz piano lessons. And so I take jazz piano lessons from this kid who is so patient because I, I don't read music. I play it by ear and I, he, he could, once he saw me, he said, you know, this is just a lost cause. All teachers did that when I was a child. And I said, well, can we figure out some way that you accommodate yourself um, uh, to my inabilities and teach me within them? And sure enough, he, we have we have a whole playlist and he works and he plays beautifully himself and he, he's got his own group. And uh, then I just listen. And because I can pick it up, not all of it, but I can pick up a lot by listening. That's the way I'm learning. So I've got um, I'd like to keep that up. I really enjoy it. Yeah. What uh, what's your favorite book that you wrote? What, what are you most proud of? Well, it, there's a sadness laced in it. There are uh, there are two. One was Making Toast, which was a big book for, in terms of the attention it drew. And that was when our daughter died 15 years ago. And I talked about the family, uh, how the family put itself together. Ginny and I lived with our grandchildren for seven and a half years after our daughter died, after Amy died. And so it was about the first of those years. And then the, the next one followed it because I didn't I didn't really talk about how I was feeling in that book. I told us in a sense what we were doing. So I wrote that with Kayak, I wrote Kayak Morning, which is um, at least one or, one of my favorite books. It, it's one I at least, favorite means that I'm not judging it as um, great or not great or anything, but just feeling some personal connection uh, to it. Um, the most personal connection that was about grief. And The Boy Detective was about growing up in New York City uh, and what that was uh, like. And this, which so, um, and I'm attached to that. And I'm very attached to this new book, uh, which um, is strange. I mean, it really is strange combining three disparate uh, things, but uh, it, uh, uh, it pleases me in ways of invention that I could move from. I, I usually write from just sections, like movements in music or movements in jazz. This goes this, goes this, goes this. Uh, and in this one, I really like the way the, uh, the thing moves and it does have the effect of music. Um, uh, just because you uh, know about it, uh, what about, and, and participated and founded it, describe the, uh, the uh, writer's conference so people know more about it. It is, uh, it's great. It, it, it draws uh, people from all over the world, actually. This and is it's, Southampton, in Southampton. Yeah, to, they come to Southampton for a couple of weeks. It started, that is the big, it, it always existed in a kind of uh, low, uh, low level way. But we knew that it required something of a, of a shot to draw attention. So I don't know if you remember Bob Sillerman, who was a sure. fellow. Um, anyway, he was a very wealthy man who lost his money, as oddly enough. Um, but very wealthy man who supported LIU and supported our writing program wholeheartedly. He and his wife, Laura. Laura, uh, Bob died a few years ago, and Laura is still alive, a little ill. Uh, a stunning woman, a wonderful poet, generous, uh, intelligent beyond description. And he and he, Bob and Laura, uh, had me over to their house, which was a gorgeous house in Southampton on the ocean. And uh, they said, in effect, what do you need to make this conference go? And I said, people, if I can get the people for it and I can tell them 
that they're going to not get paid. They're not going to get paid a lot of money, but something good will be attached to it. Um, then we can do this. So I called uh, Frank McCourt, whom I knew and was a friend. McCourt, I don't know if you knew Frank. You would love him. He would have loved you. He, is, he was born with generosity. So if you ask him for anything, he, yes, yes, yes. The answer is always yes. So Frank said yes immediately. Then I called Edgar Doctorow, whom I also knew, and I told him that Frank was doing it. And Edgar said yes. And Edgar is a very generous man. And from then on, it started to get easy. I got Joyce Carol Oates. I got Margaret Atwood. Billy Collins was already set to come because he was a, uh, connected to the, uh, to the program. And before you knew it, you had five or six really first-class writers uh, of international reputation. Uh, and then all you have to say is, they're here, won't you come? And the, then the conference was made. What, uh, what, what, what uh, dates are the conference or this summer? Because you, uh, It varies, uh, usually mid-July. Uh, it usually runs 10 days from mid-July to the end of the month. And people can uh, join up and that'll continue on. Uh, and people can pay to come to all the different events that go on. Uh, it's it's oddly not that well promoted because it's it's uh, no, that that's the fault of Stony Brook too. I mean, it's probably our fault too. Has been our fault, but we're not promoters, and you know we don't we don't really know how to do this. But a university ought to know how to do it. And um, if uh, the if Stony Brook had realized what it had in its hands, uh, what a what a treasure it had in its hand, and decided to push really for it. Uh, we would have had more. Still, no complaints. We always fill the conference. Uh, everybody seems happy. But in terms of what you're describing, some some real uh, publicity, some uh, some uh, wider reputation, we could certainly use a boost. How many people could sign up to uh, come to the conference? What was the limit in terms of total number of people? You know, I I don't know because it, I think my guess is that it expanded in, in terms of how many people did want to sign up. We could always get the riders to teach the courses. But yes. say, say somewhere between 100 and 150. Yes, it's, uh, it's surprising that uh, it isn't that well promoted, but there it is. Right. Well, thank you for being on the podcast with these. I will be, I'll be seeing you. We, we're also in the city as well, uh, part-time, and we'll get together there. We will make a point of that, absolutely. Thank so, you for having me. Talking to Roger Rosenblatt. Um, who um, is one of America's wonderful writers that I've, I've come across and I want to, uh, I'll see you soon. Take care. You bet, you bet, that's a deal. <laughs>